Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, we are continuing on into our video series on Secret Wars, and we are covering part three, the Earth's superheroes versus Galactus. But before we start to this, this video is sponsored by Skillshare. So Skillshare is an online learning community that offers membership with meaning. With so much to explore, real projects to create, and the support of fellow creatives, Skillshare empowers you to accomplish your goals. One of my favorite classes is Real Productivity, How to Build Habits That Last, which is taught by Thomas Frank. In this class, you learn things like how to determine your goals, how to set yourself up for success, how to use external systems, and probably one of the most important aspects, what to do when you fail, and how to keep yourself motivated. So if you're looking to expand on your skills or gain new ones, and you also wanna do this in an incredibly affordable way, especially when compared to pricey in-person classes and workshops, then Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to help you explore your creativity if you click the link in the description box. And after that, it's only around $10 a month. You know, now that I think about it, I feel like I should go on Skillshare and teach people how to become comic book YouTubers. <laughs> That'd be pretty awesome. But in the last video, we were talking about how, or at least we ended the video basically, with Galactus forming his ship for the purpose of like consuming Battle War, right? Because that's Galactus's thing. He usually brings the ship with him, the parts that he needs are on the ship. It's better than just toting them around, right? Like Galactus walking around with like a giant backpack, you know, just like, like all like just throwing it on his back, like Peter McKinnon style, and then just like consuming worlds. <laughs> Galactus with a cup of coffee and like, like giving you tutorials on how to consume worlds. But nonetheless, in the last video, we were talking about how Galactus was basically in the process of getting ready to consume all of Battleworld. And what this does is it sets up a pretty tricky situation. For the heroes, you've already got a lot of infighting. That's one of the things that we've kind of discussed here is a lot of the infighting going on insofar as everybody kind of parceling themselves out and forming their own different factions, right? So the X-Men have their own faction, the Avengers have their own faction, the villains have their own faction, and it kind of goes down from there. And then in turn, now you have a bigger threat in the form of Galactus. Now, the benefit of this is that it unites everybody, right? It's kind of the unifying factor. It's the immediate threat. And the truth is that given the nature of Galactus, it'll take pretty much everybody to be involved in this in order to pull it off. Now, the other part here, and this is this is kind of a funny thing, the other part here is that Colossus is sort of thinking about Kitty Pride, the fact that he's so far from her, the fact that he misses her, and he's just kind of daydreaming and thinking about it when Xavier appears out of nowhere, and he's like, Colossus, come at once, you know, and it's like, Colossus, stop tugging on it, you know, like it's... <laughs> It's kind of a funny little thing. I always thought that was entertaining. But in any event, one of the things that I hope you guys are noticing about Xavier in this story is that his patience is exceedingly thin, right? He's acting a lot more like a jerk than you would normally expect. It's, it's something to kind of take note of. Uh, it's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Now, the other part of this is the Molecule Man. Now, remember, the Molecule Man is essentially the most powerful being in the universe, albeit Owen Reese doesn't really use his powers to his full extent. And we'll find out why as we progress further through Secret Wars. But of course, he's found a kind of romance in Volcana, right? In, in Marsha Rose. And so they end up running up on a, on a handful of these guys and some of them start giving him shit, right? They start giving him a hard time. And the result of this is that the Molecule Man's like, okay, so like, like one of them calls him, calls him like a nerd or something like that. And he, and like, he starts to freak out. So he basically turns the guy's suit into like metal, right? He alters the molecules or the atoms of his suit, turns it into metal and then just leaves him there. And then Marsha stomps his face into the ground. Now, this is a very important lesson to understand kids. Violence is not always the answer. That's true, but it is a answer. And it's usually a very effective one. So just something to keep in mind. <laughs> if you're going to pick a fight, make sure it's a fight you can win. But at the end of the day, uh, of course, this is also one of the, the crazy displays of, of Owen Reese's power is he basically uses the atoms of the air around him to kind of coalesce them into various molecules and then form a kind of chariot for him and Volcano to basically fly off on. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. The Molecule Man altered the atomic and subatomic structure of matter so that he could create a chariot out of thin air using the, the atoms around him in the air and then in turn use his power to fly. Fly. It's a ridiculous display of power. And these are the kind of things that you're seeing. Now, I'm, I'm hoping that if you're familiar with Owen Reese, and even if you're not, right? I mean, he never really used a whole lot of his power in a really grand scheme, at least not really like this, you know, previously. It's the small little things like this that highlight the idea that Owen Reese is beginning to learn how to use his power more effectively. Now, the next thing that you get is you get Enchantress showing up to Dr. Doom. Now, normally I would just kind of skim past this, but this is exceedingly important. And the reason why is because Enchantress is one of these characters where she's been around for a very, very, very long time. And she's fought some very heavy hitters, right? When 
Asgard was invaded by Man God, she was there, right? Like she was there watching it all go down. And so she knows how dangerous like big level threats can be. What you end up getting here uh, is you end up getting Enchantress who's, who's seen some pretty heavy hitters and understands the severity of the situation. Remember in the very first issue, Galactus tried to go after the Beyonder and was batted away like an insect and then sent crashing down to battle world where he was left unconscious for a short amount of time, right? So like the Beyonder knocked Galactus out cold without even really physically touching him, right? Just like kind of with a spray of his power is really how that happened. And so Enchantress understanding the grand scheme of things really kind of goes to Dr. Doom and it's just like, we should leave this place, right? Like there's a kind of barrier that prevents us from leaving, but given your, your knowledge of sorcery, given my knowledge of magic and sorcery and so on and so forth, we can find a way to leave. And initially Dr. Doom's response is no, like that's not going to happen. You know, I'm going to take the prize of the Beyonder and I'm going to get everything that I, that I've ever desired. And then Enchantress actually offers to fix the face of Dr. Doom. Now, one, that, that's kind of one of the big talking points of his character, right? The fact that his face was scarred at, you know, at, at, at one point in the past. And if you read books of Doom, you get one origin. If you read uh, Stanley and Jack Kirby's Fantastic Four Annual Number 2, which I actually have the physical copy of, which is amazing, uh, you get another origin. But nonetheless, the face of Dr. Doom uh, was scarred. Largely, it's, it's believed that it was scarred, uh, not in the explosion he sustained in college, but when he basically started forming his, uh, his, his armor and then he put the hot mask on his face, that's what scarred his face, right? But regardless, it's always kind of been one of these things where he's always tried to find a way to cure his scars so he can take his mask off. Uh, when Enchantress offers that for a moment, Dr. Doom takes it, but then immediately says, no, that's not going to happen because what I have to gain by taking the power of the Beyonder dwarfs whatever you can give me with your magics and your, your seductive nature and, and so on and so forth. And so the result is that he basically sends her packing. Now, of course, you know, with her, she's just kind of like, okay, you know, let's leave. But she's absolutely terrified of what could happen here because the truth is they could all really die, right? Like the, the, the possibility of their death is a real and a tangible thing. Now, the other thing about this, and this is one of the coolest displays of Galactus's power is that with what he's trying to do in terms of reconstitute his machinery and then consume all the energies of battle world and basically leave it a dead husk and killing everybody on it in the process is you have Charles Xavier and you have Magneto who really kind of try to create this sort of beacon and trying to get the attention of Galactus where Reed Richards and all of them are sort of looking at what's going on. Galactus just kind of looks towards the direction of Xavier and, and Magneto and blows up that portion of the Citadel, right? Just like just detonates it right now. It's, it's, it's an easy thing to look over, but understand this, like Galactus just looks over their direction and presumably destroys a huge portion of their vessel, right? Without even going to it, without even like walking over there and like channeling his power through his hands or anything like that. That's the kind of power that we're talking about here. It's interesting. And it's a small little thing. I always love seeing stuff like that, but I thought it might be interesting to point attention to. The other part of this is that what he ends up doing is summary, uh, summoning a device of his own creation to deal with the Avengers and to deal with, with all the forces who were there. And that's one of the things to remember about Galactus right? He doesn't really care about the goings on of mortals. They don't matter to him. And in truth, it kind of makes sense, right? Galactus was born into this universe. He's going to die with this universe and be born into the next one, right? He'll live for all, for all eternity, right? So long as the multiverse continues to exist and any one universe or this universe that he's in can die and be reborn again, Galactus will always live on. Now we know from various stories in the past that we've seen and with a history of the Marvel universe by Mark Wade that Galactus and, and, and uh, Franklin Richards will actually merge into a singular being and then be born into the next universe. But Galactus doesn't care, right? I mean, the life and death of any one of the superheroes passes like that in the eyes of Galactus, right? In the time that he's been around, in the billions of years he's existed, and the billions of more years that he will exist, their life will have been a moment in time. So he doesn't care about any of them. It's really kind of beneath him to like engage in a physical fight. Instead, he sends out somewhat of a proxy. And by and large, this proxy isn't really designed to overpower and destroy the heroes. It's designed to keep them distracted, keep them away, right? So it's like being tracked by a, by a whole bunch of hungry wolves and then just like killing some deer and leaving it there for the wolves to feed on so they're not coming after you. And for the most part, they're initially successful here insofar as the heroes manage to take down this, you know, this massive robot and that's kind of the end of that. But then from there, you also have the villains who end up showing up uh, with regards to the heroes themselves, right? The heroes facing off against the villains, a fight kind of breaks out yet again. And for the most part, the fight plays out the way you would expect it to. But here's the important thing that goes on here. While Galactus is doing all this, while Galactus is focusing on building his machinery and while the heroes and the villains are all facing off against each other, the X-Men and the Avengers are fighting against all the villains, what you have is Dr. Doom. And this is the important thing. This is this is the reason why Dr. Doom is so dangerous because Dr. Doom is an opportunist. He's exceedingly smart and he can usually create his own opportunities, but if one presents itself to him, he will take it. And what he's been looking for is a way to basically usurp the power of Galactus. That's what he's been looking for all this time, a way to take the power of Galactus and then in turn, try to find a way to steal the power of the Beyonder. And so while everybody's engaging in all these fights and Galactus is distracted doing his thing and the heroes and villains are distracted doing 
doing their thing. What you get is Dr. Doom, who basically boards the ship of Galactus. And when he gets in there, he starts kind of poking around, taking a look, seeing what's going on. When he gets in there, what you end up having here is you end up having a return of Ulysses' claw. Now, here's the funny thing about this, right? Ulysses' claw coming back doesn't matter, right? If you're just kind of like, well, I mean, like, who cares about that? You're right. Nobody cares. Nobody cares that Ulysses' claw is back. The reason why he's back and the way in which he quote unquote died is hilarious. So like what ended up happening is in Dazzler volume one, issue number nine, uh, Ulysses' claw, I remember reading this. <laughs> It was terrible. Ulysses' claw ends up running up on, on Dazzler, right? And Dazzler has the ability to absorb sound and turn it into light energy. So literally, Ulysses' claw is made of sound. So like, he goes running up on her and she's like, no, nah, I ain't got time for this. And she just like absorbs him. <laughs> And that's basically it. Like he just, he gets, he's totally deuced on by Dazzler. She just like absorbs him into herself. And she's like, all done folks, back to what you were doing. And, like, <laughs> and that's basically it. Now, the funny thing is that takes place in issue number nine and issues 10 and 11, she's taken by Galactus to become his herald in order to basically free and 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 uh, and get back Terax the Tamer. And that's kind of a funny thing because when the question is asked by Dr. Doom, like, like, why are you here? Like, how did you manage to get here? Like, why are you on Galactus' ship? What you find out is that when Dazzler was taken by Galactus, she initially tried to fight. And she blasted Galactus with a whole bunch of light energy, which was basically her just kind of like dispelling uh, Ulysses' claw. And when that happened, Ulysses' claw really kind of seemed to vibrate or remain within the physical ship itself. And then ultimately was coalesced down into this energy form that Dr. Doom ultimately released. Uh, but it's kind of funny because as soon as Ulysses' claw is done telling the story, Dr. Doom's like, whatever, man, I don't care. Like you bore me. And which is pretty much the response of everybody who's reading this story. <laughs> Everybody was just kind of like, uh, it's Ulysses Claw, man. Like he's he's only ever done like one good thing and that was invade Wakanda and that was it. Nonetheless, the idea of Dr. Doom is to usurp the power of Galactus, to steal the power of Galactus. So what he does is he basically forms a plan with Ulysses Claw and says, you're going to go down to the surface and you're going to give this plan to them. And you're going to tell people what's going on, at least in so far as what I want them to know. And that's basically going to be it. But what it does is it brings all the villains basically to this giant volcano that kind of exists out there. And then of course, Charles Xavier using his powers to kind of scan the minds of everybody ultimately coming across the Enchantress, who's just like, get out of my head, your powers suck, and then just like shuts him out. <laughs> uh, ultimately leads to Xavier bringing the X-Men back and then in turn sending him on this mission. But here's an important thing that goes on here. Storm, as it stands right now, is the leader of the X-Men, right? This came as part of the End of the Dark Phoenix Saga and the fallout to the End of the Dark Phoenix Saga when Cyclops was basically leaving the X-Men team. And there was a kind of duel that took place between him and Storm to determine who the leader of the team should be. And Storm ultimately ended up winning. And so because Storm overpowered Cyclops, she was now the field commander. Cyclops left to do his own thing, which really went into like Madeline Pryor and all that kind of good stuff and the birth of Cable, so on and so forth. But Storm was not one of the, well, she really didn't fall rank and file with Cyclops insofar as Cyclops was a believer, right? He was a person that you couldn't sway. You couldn't convince him that Xavier was wrong. He believed 100% in the dream. And the truth is that while Storm believes in the idea of the dream, she doesn't see everything exactly the way that Xavier does. And so where Xavier is, is really being a, really acting a lot like a dick in a lot of ways storm calls him out and it's just like i'm the one who commands the x-men team you're the teacher right you're the instructor you're the you're the tutor and that's cool and everything but don't be confused about your place in the bigger picture when it comes to us going out on missions the fact that you're here doesn't change anything in relation to what it is that i do what i do is i command the team when we're out in the field right now we're out in the field you just happen to be out here with us but understand i'm the one making the orders i'm the one making the call i'm the one that tells people what to do let me do my damn job that's basically her response here and it's kind of cool because Xavier really doesn't seem to back down. He's kind of like, no, the stakes are hugely high. You can't possibly seem to fathom it, understand it, and all that kind of stuff. And Storm's like, I don't care. It's my job to command the team. If you have insight, give me insight. But do not take my job away from me. I will do my job myself. You know, and it's it's a cool moment. It's one of these things that, that, that Jim Shooter was really good at kind of continuing on the writing of Chris Claremont, if only for a small degree, right? He couldn't do this for the long term. Ultimately, he would lose himself in his own style of writing and everything Chris Claremont did would kind of go away. But in this moment right here, it really is an almost perfect reflection of what Chris Claremont would have done because he would have, he would have written it the exact same way. You also get a few other things going on here. For example, Colossus is really starting to dream more of this, this girl, uh, you know, Sazi, I think it's how you pronounce her name or Saji, uh, who's one of the, the local villagers who's been running around healing people. What you have right now is Johnny Storm, who's basically in love with this chick and they're like hanging out and dating and like kissing and hugging and all that kind of cool stuff. And so Colossus is developing feelings too, which is kind of messed up because like Colossus, man, here's look, here's the thing, man. Colossus, you got to get up on that game, man. Cause if you, if you, if you let it keep going the way it is, Johnny Storm, 
storm's gonna get the girl and you're gonna be left standing there feeling sad and, and bad for yourself man do what you got to do right all's fair in love and war right so that's that's basically it you know and so um, but the, the, the thing about colossus is he's kind of torn right on one side it's kitty pride who is his love interest back on earth on the other side is this chick he just met who he feels like he's in love with but doesn't really know that well right you know so it was really more feelings of infatuation than anything else uh but it's kind of leaving colossus a little bit torn and even to some degree a little bit heartbroken you know with regards to the fact that johnny storms with this chick you know doing doing you know they're, they're doing the damn thing and like colossus is just like laying in a bed you know wishing he was with kitty pride but also kind of likes this chick too make a choice man like quit quit resting on your laurels <laughs> make a choice and do something but with the x-men basically tracking the various villains down to this massive volcano and then all of them really sort of engaging in a fight with each other things get kind of interesting here right because as the volcano begins to erupt right as it begins to sort of go off the x-men bail and instead the question kind of becomes like how can anybody stop galactus right so this one doesn't really end on the same kind of cliffhanger as the, as the ones we've seen before right but the question is can anybody stop galactus and how does anybody do it the answer is actually going to come in a more interesting way than you probably think but with that being said guys we're going to bring this video to an end if you are new here to comments explained make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the rob core if you guys enjoyed this video make sure you drop a like and i will catch you all later peace